Good afternoon to all our audience. We are hoping that we have as much of a turnout as the signups um, promised. So welcome to our um, second seminar in, the, um, in, the, in our series under the theme Society, Culture and Law, um, a research theme within the School of Security Studies at King's College London. I have the great pleasure to introduce two eminent people in the field of strategic communications research. Um, our speaker, Dr. Claire York, whom I will in, um, introduce in a minute, and our chair, Dr. Neville Bolt, who is the director of the King's Center for Strategic Communications. He is also editor-in-chief of the Defense Strategic Communications um, uh, journal, a peer-reviewed academic journal of NATO's Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. Then he's a reader in strategic communications and convener of the master's programs on the same theme. And he has a not misspent previous life in um, television, um, both as a television journalist and producer editor at the BBC, ITV and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. He has, he has the pleasure to chair Claire's talk. And um, I am now going to hand over to Claire, who is um, really delighted to have her here because she will be talking to us about an incredibly important um, subject and uh, one that is really in much need of understanding better. And hopefully also, at least that's my, my I'm part of my mission here, proselytizing on the theme, whether a more empathetic politics is possible. Claire is a writer and academic researcher. And she has just finished a very successful Kissinger postdoc um, period at Yale University. And she's currently preparing her book on and related to the theme of empathy um, in strategic communications, which we will all await with bated breath. And she will tell us more about at some later stage. But without further ado, and to give the person who really needs the limelight the limelight, I hand over to Claire. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to be back at King's uh, where I did my PhD um, and to talk about a topic that I really love and that I uh, care very passionately about and have been studying um, for the past few years. So thank you. Claire, um, good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us today. And uh, it's, it, it is a pleasure to see you back at King's actually. And um, we had a great time together. Um, I did, certainly. It was a pleasure and a privilege to supervise your doctorate. Uh, and um, I think it's fair to point out that your eminent examiners, and they were eminent examiners, um, uh, concluded that yours was one of the best PhDs they had ever read. Um, so congratulations to you. But you've moved on since then. Uh, those, are, those are the old days. So let's talk about empathy. You, um, you researched in depth the Nixon-Mao talks of the 1970s, and what engaged you was trying to understand what was the role of empathy. And, you know, we throw this word around, empathy, and a lot of people don't even know the difference between empathy and sympathy, but more to the point, you would argue they actually don't really know what empathy means. Um, why don't you tell us? Yeah, so I'm really interested in how we understand and conceptualize empathy. And I think it's such a critical component of human relations, but it's not simply one thing. Um, and often we see this division in how empathy is defined, where it's emotional or it's cognitive. So it's kind of a feeling that we have towards another or towards others that's very innate, uh, something embodied, and we feel that and we experience that sense of connection. But then you've also got this cognitive dimension, which is much more of a conscious process of reflecting on the lived experiences of others and trying to understand how they view the world, what does the world mean to them, where do people derive value and significance in their everyday lives, and how does that inform the way in which they engage and interact with the world around them. And I would argue on top of that, we've got these different forms and other people also write on different forms of empathy, but I would categorize them for the purpose of this talk um, as interpersonal empathy, which is the kind of empathy that you see between two people, um, how people develop a sense of connection or rapport with another and feel that sense of, I know this person, I can work with this man, as Margaret Thatcher famously said. 
Um, you've then got what I call strategic or political empathy, which is used to communicate or connect with audiences of part, as part of political discourse. And this is more to do with the communication of empathy from say an individual or a small group of individuals to a collective, because often empathy is understood as between individuals or between small groups. Whereas I think it's something that can be very much communicated in dialogues in performances in signaling to show other people that they matter to them, that they're being heard and listened and understood and that their concerns and grievances are being taken into account. And then I think that as part of that, I think there's an important role to consider of empathy of um, performance. So performative empathy and the sense that the very act of performing empathy has itself a value or a virtue because empathy has these connotations of virtue. So there's then this difference between performative empathy and sincere empathy. And I think that's one of the things that we sometimes see in this space is that people feel the need to demonstrate empathy. And so we need to interrogate, but is that actually translating to genuine empathy and concern? How much is that going into actual decision-making processes, informing the ways in which they're changing their attitudes and behaviors towards different people in different groups? Um, and so I want to think about it as well in that sense. And as part of that, um, it really draws our attention to this difference between the rhetoric and reality. Because rhetoric about empathy is far easier. You can talk about it. We know certain codes of expressing understanding for others. We know what it is you have to be saying. I feel your pain, as Bill Clinton famously did in that election. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's the real hard work of empathy. And that's something I really want to kind of emphasize in, in this talk, that actually empathy is not something light and fluffy. It's hard work, it's a process, it's a practice, and it's about really taking on the very difficult challenge of trying to understand and tolerate difference in order to connect across divides. And I think it's so important right now when we're dealing with such a polarized and divided political space that we're able to start to talk about what does this actually mean? What is the hard work? What are the practices that we have to do? to try and create something that's better and that transcends the challenges that we're facing today. Um, and so I think, I mean, empathy, I think is inherently political. It, mm -hmm. it has um, a lot of challenges, a lot of problems associated with it. And I think the more we understand that, the more we understand the limitations and the problems with empathy, that it's not just that nice fluffy thing you insert into a debate and suddenly things sound better, but we understand it's real, the courage and the hard work that you have to do, I think, we get closer to them being able to realize it. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, I suppose the question is, apart from the fact that you've written a PhD and, uh, and uh, very shortly we'll publish a book on this, but why are, we, why are we increasingly talking about empathy? I mean, I think there's multiple, I think there's multiple reasons. At first, I think we're seeing um, in the context of the pandemic, the real importance of trying to understand how this virus that is still so unknown, um, we still don't know what it means, but it is causing such kind of havoc and um, hardship to people in terms of welfare and health and livelihoods and well-being, that there is this real need within our political leadership for empathy and for concern and also for compassion for people from many different backgrounds to show that people and in the highest echelons of government and politics are taking it seriously. Um, we're also seeing empathy um, being discussed in new forms of leadership. So we're seeing a lot of praise, for example, for Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and others who really used empathy, both in response to the terrorist attacks in Christchurch a couple of years ago, but in her response as well to this um, coronavirus crisis. Um, really centralizing it as part of her discourse about how politics should be conducted. She spoke about it at the World Economic Forum. She's really tried to put it at the heart of economic policies and welfare policies. Um, and she's also not the only one to do so. Barack Obama in 2006 was talking about an empty deficit and about the way in which society had lost sight of one another that we had lost our ability to connect and that actually society and politics had become about interests, about financial gain, about economics. And really what we'd missed is that society is about people and politics is about people. Um, and we're seeing it again now in um, the American elections. It's very much central to um, Vice President Joe Biden's campaign, this idea that he is a person who connects with the everyman. He's a person who really 
as a man of character, prioritizes empathy in his dealings with people in his politics. But we've also seen it, as I wrote about in an article recently for The World Today, in how um, President Trump is talking about himself. It was a feature of the Republican National Convention as well as the Democratic National Convention, where they're talking about how Trump called his staff when they were sick to check they were okay, and how he was mm. talking to certain frontline care workers. And this performative empathy really coming to the fore, that it was seen as a political tool and an asset for both campaigns. Um, but I think with all of that considered as well, what I want to come back to is that idea of empathy offers us a great lens for understanding and interpreting emotions and for understanding what is going on right now when we're looking at um, the rise in identity politics, we're looking at increased divisions within society um, and polarization, we're looking at real, pro really prominent debates about inequality and injustice and racism and um, the lack of care and the sense of marginalization that people are feeling. And I think it's so important that people are saying we need to be able to incorporate far more awareness of different lived experiences into our politics. And we need to, I think, understand how different people are feeling, how people not only engage with politics in the level of reason and rationality, but how they are experiencing it at a very felt level and what that means collectively for public moods, for public attitudes, for what people are responding to. And I think those emotions in this political space are often unquantifiable and um, hard to really decipher, but we can and we should be trying to understand um, what what the implications are for different politics on different communities and how then you navigate that um, with a more nuanced understanding um, of lived experience. Mm. I'm interested in uh, this bridge between um, rhetorical empathy as performative politics and also, can I just call it individual sincerity okay. on that level? Um, because a lot of the time, and you know, the, the American election is very much presidential election, very much in our minds at the moment. And for an awful lot of um, international, let's call them intellectuals, empathy is uh, associated with uh, Biden as being very much part of his makeup, his personality, and that it's genuine, it's sincere. And yet when Donald Trump employs it with his supporters and sympathizers, somehow we sus we're suspicious of that. We see it as a, a tool of politics. Is that unfair, do you think? I, I mean, I think it really speaks to me to some of the challenges of empathy. And, and you're right to point out the challenges that we have in deciphering and interpreting it. Um, and I think it speaks to the subjectivity of empathy and our own positionality. And I struggle with this as well, because I think we have this idea that empathy is about kindness and it's about care. And I think that for the most part is true. But we also have to think about, is it empathy if I don't like what it looks like? If it doesn't speak to me or to the causes and the concerns that I have, is it still empathy? And I think what's so interesting is how particularly populist leaders have been quite effective at mobilizing this performance of concern um, for other people in their politics, at trying to say, we understand your grievances, we understand how you view that the political establishment have not spoken to you and have marginalized you or forgotten you. And we are gonna offer a different alternative that speaks to what it is that you care about and the insecurity or the uncertainty that you're feeling. Um, and so with Trump, I think it's hard to argue that he has that personal sincerity of care in the way we see with Biden. But I'm also not convinced that his supporters want that from him. Um, I think it's quite interesting looking at how we have different expectations of our political leaders, how we have a different um, need for concern depending on our own experience with politics and what we value within society and our interaction. Mm. Um, and I think actually talking to people who do vote for Trump, Trump when I was in America, you know, they, they would say, well, we know that he's vulgar and we know that he says it like it is and sometimes it's not very polished, but he speaks to the concerns we have and we don't see other people doing that in the same way. He says it like it is. And I think that's something we have to be thinking about is what's happened in this political environment that means that people no longer feel that politicians are maybe speaking to them 
authentically or speaking to them and reflecting the reality of what they are experiencing. Um, so it's definitely part of the subjectivity of it. And I struggle with that because it does mean we have to maybe consider that empathy isn't always something that we find palatable. And because it's so difficult for us to understand or, or get inside this subjectivity or multiple subjectivities, um, let me just go back to your original research back in the, which dealt with the 1970s, but most importantly, it was um, transnational, transcultural. And so when you were looking at Richard Nixon, uh, uh, who sat down with uh, Mao, both global leaders, but from different cultures, but maybe not such different backgrounds, maybe, uh, spiritually. Um, how does that complicate this discussion? I mean, I think, I think what was so interesting with that is seeing the ways in which President Nixon and Henry Kissinger prepared for those talks um, and really were conscious that there would be a divide in how each country approached the topic and the, the impressions that each side have of the head of the world. And I think again, I mean, Nixon, like Trump, it's hard to argue was um, sincerely empathetic in the way that we would associate with Joe Biden or others. But he starts, when he speaks with uh, Chairman Mao, he tries to find points of connection with this leader um, of the People's Republic of China, you know, we both come from humble origins. We've both risen to be these great men in our own nations. We both understand the challenges and the weights that are on our shoulders. You know, and it's, it's debatable whether the Chinese saw him as sincere or not. You know, but this sense of performance that he felt that the way we get this done is by building this personal relationship. And he did a lot in terms of reading um, the literature um, that Chairman Mao was reading, trying to understand what it was that they would be prioritizing. Um, and I think in many ways, empathy is so critical, particularly across cultures, particularly in terms of trying to bridge those different divides in understanding and meaning within different societies. But I think that's where we find common points of humanity. We find that we're all individuals. We all um, can find things in common despite our differences. And you see this kind of in the practices they do and Kissinger as well in his much more extended discussions with uh, Joe and Lai would yeah. constantly try to speak to um, the intellectual interests and the background of his counterpart and try to understand the concerns and the grievances and the insecurities that the Chinese felt at that moment in time faced with um, the Soviet Union on their borders, faced with a sense of uncertainty in the global environment. Um, so, Did you get a sense that, the, um, that Mao and the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party were actually going through the same process vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Nixon? I, I did. I mean, I think, I mean, it's interesting. You see, there's one of the transcripts where Zhou Enlai talks about how he watched Patton, the film, because he knew that it was uh, Nixon's favorite film and how this film gave him, him an insight into the mind of Nixon. And I think it's actually just part of good negotiating practice that you try and understand the person at the other side of the table from you and you try and connect. And I think good diplomats, um, good politicians are very aware of this, that you can't do business with someone if you're not willing to speak their language in some form, you're not able to find mutual points of connection and engage with them and meet them where they are. Um, and I think sometimes we've lost sight of that a little bit, you know, that it becomes just about interests. But you can't do that if you don't have trust and you don't have mutual respect. And that was one thing that really emerged through the archives is how much Nixon and Kissinger spoke about that importance of trust. And empathy was a vehicle to build in that. And that's something that people like Professor Nick Wheeler um, and Ken Booth have written a lot on, you know, this centrality of trust. Um, and empathy is a real vehicle to help build that especially when there's been long periods of animosity between two sides. And so how do those thoughts resonate with what we are seeing with a week to go to the American election with two candidates who appear to despise each other? I mean, I think it's just so interesting to see the nature of discourse in the US right now, the kind of the debates where you see how dialogue has really declined, that there is this real division between the two sides and this lack of ability to build consensus. And I think looking forward, what's going to be key, whoever wins? And I think 
especially because um, Joe Biden has campaigned on a platform of empathy and unity and building back better. This kind of, um, how does he reach out to those people who didn't vote Democrat? And especially for those who are undecided or who are not on the more extreme edge of uh, the political spectrum. Yeah. How do they say to them, you didn't vote for me, but I'm still gonna care about your interests and your concerns. Because to move forward, um, there really needs to be this period of healing and this period of dialogue. Um, th there needs to be this sense of overcoming the divisions, finding areas of commonality, because otherwise I think there's a danger they will entrench even more. We're seeing such division within the rhetoric and such kind of shaming as well on both sides. I think that's one thing we're seeing in the US and we also see in the UK, the, the mobilization and weaponization of shame and humiliation of our political opponents. And I think it really makes it very hard to find a political space where both sides can come together. When you start to deny another side their dignity, even if you disagree with them and you think their politics is awful, and even if you don't respect where they're coming from, to not show them the dignity and give them space to at least engage in dialogue and listen, to find those points of commonality, to find, okay, we disagree on this, but actually we're both concerned about our economic well-being. We're both actually concerned that our children are healthy, that they have schools to go to, and that we have jobs. And so I think that's gonna be key for whoever leads. I'm not sure how a new Donald Trump administration would do that because we haven't really seen that during the last few years from him. But I, I think it's something we much more would expect from Biden, but I don't think it's going to be easy. I think there's going to be many years ahead of um, trying to rebuild the, the, the kind of bridge and reconnect with society and both in Congress um, in their political establishments and institutions where there's been a real lack of cross party collaboration since really the period of Reagan, um, but also within society and communities themselves. Yes, I don't want to be the vo sound like the voice of doom, but um, you, you don't feel that the positions are so entrenched in American society, not just American society, more broadly in Western democratic societies also, we see the similar things happening. You don't think that positions are so deeply entrenched that you, as a, an advisor to policymakers, and politicians that you would have to just throw your hands up in the air and say, sorry, we have nowhere to go on this. Um, you know me and you know I'm an eternal optimist. I so, do. Uh, <laughs> so no, I, I don't. But I do think it's a case of, you know, rolling up your sleeves and being really prepared to go, right, what have we learned from this period? And I think this is interesting because it speaks to the importance, for example, of honesty and for um, apology and for acknowledgement of error. We have not done this right. We have made errors. And I think particularly for the, for the Democrats in the US to be able to say, okay, you felt like maybe democratic politics has failed you. We've had this vision of liberal international politics that was meant to help everybody and create opportunities. And some of you don't feel like we have. Yeah. And this is what we're gonna do about it. Um, and the same in the UK. I mean, looking at the way in which the pandemic has been dealt with, I think there is this need to say, we, we haven't got this right. And again, looking last week at the, the case with Marcus Rashford and um, mm -hmm. food for schools, mm -hmm. having someone come out and say, we got this wrong. This is how we're going to rectify it. And it's a real concerted, concrete plan of action that will make a difference and that acknowledges that maybe we misread the mood. And that's one thing we see from leaders who model good empathy is that they're not above accepting where they've made mistakes. You know, that they're humble enough to say, the facts have changed or my understanding has changed and now I'm going to change course. Um, I, and I do think one thing the pandemic has shown us is the power of communities to come together in a crisis. And yes, it's been complicated by confused lockdown rules and by maybe, you know, breakdowns in trust in society towards political institutions or towards one another, but I think it's still possible that we can reconnect with that sentiment that had people staying home, looking after one another, making sure that those who are most vulnerable were cared for. There's something there that can be built on, but it needs real genuine leadership and a commitment for something better. Mm. You mentioned before um, uh, the need for new forms of leadership. And you, and you mentioned two people very specifically, uh, Barack Obama and Jacinda Ahern in New Zealand. And a lot of people, of course, would be critical of Obama 
for being really quite intellectual, aloof, arrogant, distant, um, which is not the case with Ahern, is it? How no. do you, how do you, how would you compare those two, and and where do you see the positives in in, in either? Um, yes, and this is this is a criticism that comes up often in relation to Obama that intellectually he fully understood the power of empathy mm. and his speeches on it I mean from 2006 and onwards are beautiful yeah. you know you see um, after this awful um, attack in a church um, in in, in America um, oh, in America uh, Carolina yeah. yes where he, you know and he starts to sing Amazing mm. Grace and you see the sense of connection that he has but then other people would say, but he doesn't always do the cross-party work and he doesn't know how to connect with people if he's in the cerebral state and he's thinking. Whereas we see then with Jacinda Ardern, it seems very much in, integrated into how she engages with the world and those that she comes in contact with. And I think both are valuable. We need people who understand intellectually that empathy should be a form of should be a tool within our politics, that it should be something that we are using to try to understand how different people are living. And I think that's something that Obama did um, repeatedly in his speeches and in his outreach, trying to empower different groups and organizations. But we also need to see um, from our leaders that they are accessible as well. I think this is what Jacinda Ardern seems to do. You see her when she's hugging people after Christchurch, when she really goes out into the communities and she's also, when she's there on a Zoom call with her baby and she's being very real and normal and, you know, on TikTok making cups of tea, you know, people need to see that their leaders are accessible and that they care for them. Um, so is this, is, so are you putting all your money on one bet? Is it basically that um, we're relying on individuals to emerge in the, in the coming years? Or would you propose that there are institutional structures that we can put into place that actually help this bridge building process in order to um, highlight the, uh, the role of empathy and the need for it? I mean, I think, I think there's multiple areas that we need to be looking at. I think absolutely it's hugely dependent on leadership and the ability to model good behavior, good practice, empathetic concern, understanding and new forms of discourse. But then we also need to be looking firstly at how do our organizations and institutions incorporate empathetic understanding into how they design policy and how they engage with diverse communities and reflect the concerns and needs and interests of them and show that they are really taking this inclusive um, considered approach towards how we respond to the challenges that we're facing today. I think we also need to be talking about the media and the quality of media reporting mm. on the ability of media mm -hmm. to really lend its power. And the, the media is so powerful, like being able to shine a light on diverse stories and different accounts of um, politics and society and people's experiences in a very real and um, compelling way because it's using stories much more um, obviously and in a very emotive way. So we need to be looking at how the media provides comprehensive coverage of what we're facing and also holds governments and politicians to account that it's really doing that role um, in keeping in keeping the diversity and the inclusion of debate alive and giving people a voice where maybe they don't feel they have one but I think critically we also need to not just look to other people to solve this and I think this is where it really comes down to citizens themselves mm. how are we in our everyday life going to contribute to more empathetic politics. And that isn't about waiting for other people to do it for us. It's about sitting around the table this Christmas and saying, you know what, my uncle has crazy views on Brexit. How am I gonna listen and how am I gonna understand and have a dialogue and not just shut them down? And I know that, you know, I struggle with this as much as anybody else because we have this desire to be right and we have this desire to signal our own virtue. Um, but I think we need to be able to say, okay, where's the commonality? What do we have in common? What unites us? And how do we start to listen and genuinely listen? Not, not to think about what we're going to say next, but to really listen to what other people are saying, the stories that they have, the experiences that they have, the vulnerabilities that they're sharing, 
Um, how do we understand sources of humiliation that people have felt because of the way our political systems are structured? How do we understand the inequalities that they're experienced because systems are not working for them? How do we start to create spaces for more tolerance? And I will specify that this also should include creating clear boundaries. And I don't mean that sitting and listening to other people is about just listening, you know, no matter what they say, it also means setting clear boundaries of if you're going to say anything racist or sexist or homophobic or misogynist or anything like that, there's no space in this dialogue for that. And that's what we need to get much better at doing, at being able to kind of have tolerant, inclusive, understanding conversations with people while also being very clear on the limits of what is not acceptable. Um, and I think that's how we start to change the conversation. And I think it's a symbiotic relationship, citizens and leadership, and we start to then co-create something better. Very good. That's a perfect point uh, for me to uh, hand over now um, and to open the, the conversation out. Andrea is going to actually lead this conversation from now on. And uh, over to you, Andrea. Thank, Thank you, Claire. You. Thank you. Thank you very much to Claire and Neville for giving us an absolutely exciting intellectual ride um, through a lot of really interesting themes. Um, before we go into the discussion Q&A period, can I um, first let everyone know, because now names might be read out, that we are recording this. So if you would rather not be known by your name, then, then try to stay, stay anonymous, and I will not or, or indicate that you would rather not I read out your name. And secondly, for your questions, could you please type them into the Q&A box, um, and then I will be able to read them out and put them to Claire. Um, while everyone is thinking, um, to pick up a theme, Claire, that you almost ended on, and that is the question of, um, one's uncle's um, awkward views about Brexit. Um, if a particular theme or topic or political, almost well, an ideology has been become almost weaponized or hijacked by, arguably by a by by a group of people who have a very clear agenda, which may or may not, some people may not agree with me, but maybe very much narrower, very much more hardline than perhaps many of the people who voted for Brexit um, intended, because for them, the reason for voting for Brexit was another than the reasons for which we're now leaving, potentially with no deal, or if we have a deal with a very thin deal, and the people, some of the people who voted for Brexit might actually end up have, having to, to be punished, or being punished for that decision. Now, if there are so many other influences which have skewed the debate, is there a comeback via empathy or does it take more or something different in addition to empathy beyond the individual level? In terms of bringing different people bringing in? Together again, yeah. Yeah, I mean, empathy is always just going to be one of many tools. Um, I think what it does is it lets people feel seen and it lets people feel like they are being listened to, which is valuable. But I think as well, it also needs to be matched with a genuine understanding of where are these more extreme views coming from? And in some times, you're actually not gonna be able to negotiate with them. You're not gonna be able to say, um, to kind of uh, give validity to some of their views. So then it's, are there other points of connection? Are they talking really about frustration to do with unemployment, to do with their financial situation, to do with opportunities? Like, how do we find other points of connection? Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's interesting, there's some really interesting work done in kind of conflict resolution on how you bring in groups from the extremes, you know, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's impossible. Some groups will be beyond the scope of bringing them into the fold, but then there might be ways in which offering small amounts of, um, power or offering opportunities to connect on issues that are important to them but that do not do harm to others um, might then help kind of neutralize some of that. I mean, I think it's, it's incredibly problematic and that's the problem. And we see this as well politically when you do get people such as Hillary Clinton talk about the need to empathize with America's adversaries, then they're, um, they're questioned in 
in the house about do you really mean we're meant to empathize with isis you know and how do you politically make a case like that you know and how do you try and say well actually yes we do and maybe maybe what it is about is understanding the difference between public and private spaces it's about understanding what kinds of expressions of understanding should be done publicly and how much should be done about private initiatives or trying to find ways to build relations and build trust so that people then feel that they are able to um, engage in a process again that they're not being marginalized or sidelined in it um, but i don't think empathy is a magic bullet i think it's a real critical asset but i don't think it's a magic bullet yeah, I, I entirely agree. I, I think a, another sort of set of people I had in mind was the, 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 whole, the vertical um, question of those who voted for Brexit and those who are not driving the implementation of it. But we can park that for, for the moment because we have a question inviting you to please, but from Nikki, to please speak on the role of vulnerability and also gender, as we've talked about just in the um, Adan, in empathy. So the role of vulnerability and of gender in empathy. Yes, um, I, I think this discussion about gender and empathy is fascinating and also any discussion of vulnerability I think just speaks to one, the work of Brene Brown, um, who's kind of a sociologist who really talks about vulnerability yeah. um, and the power of people to be able to share their concerns in a, in a way that is safe um, and how do you build political environments where we don't need to see the strong man who actually doesn't have all the answers but pretends he has all the answers but therefore creates more problems because they aren't able to be vulnerable or humble enough to accept that they didn't get it right or they don't really know what they're doing and then don't really know how to manage a situation um, and therefore we'll talk you through the process and i think in gender terms we've seen throughout this pandemic um, a lot written about the power of female of women in leadership and female leadership to express concern for others to show care and compassion for citizens and to seek advice and um, change course when it's been needed and i think it's really important because it shines a light on different forms of power that power is not just about might and domination and strength and the sense of being an impervious uh, figurehead that actually power can be about vulnerability and showing that you care um, and that you want you want the best for the people that you're serving in a position of leadership. Um, but I also would argue that empathy is not an intrinsically female trait. I think there's this dimension that women have maybe been traditionally socially constructed or been conditioned to care because of the roles that people have taken within society. But actually, if we view it as just a female trait, I think we do a real disservice to many empathetic men and we should be empowering men to express more emotion and more empathy as a source of power and strength. Thank you very much. That was really enlightening. Um, I hope Nikki is, is happy with the answer. If you have further questions, please just type, type them in. Um, here's Olivia Kearney asking, thanks, or at first thanking you for a great presentation. And then she was wondering if you could speak a bit more about what you were discussing with the mobilization of shame, especially during a campaign time. I feel like there's, too often, uh, too often a do as I say, as not a do as I do approach from politicians. In the case of Biden and Trump, Biden obviously doesn't have a brash comment, uh, as brash comments as Trump, but there's still strong political rivalry and opposing Twitter comments. What have you seen in terms of the disconnect between leaders promoting some sort of empathy through their words, but their actions say otherwise? which is a stronger force, how can we work towards not undermining, to not undermine attempts at empathy? I suppose that speaks to your distinction between sincere empathy and, and performed empathy. And I was going to ask on that as well. So I'll hand over to you. Yes. Um, so I, I hear two questions in there. The first is about the use of shame, which I'll come to second. Um, and the second then is about this mismatch between what people say they are and then what they do and i to me this really speaks to the importance of integrity and we don't really talk about what it means to have integrity in politics anymore but we need to return to a view of people valuing the idea that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do um, and i think it's quite interesting looking at what happened in the uk um, during the 
lockdown, the first lockdown, I'm originally from up north. And it's so interesting to talk to people up north who really say the moment that Dominic Cummings broke lockdown is the moment we lost trust with the government. Um, and I don't know if that's understood fully in the capital. Um, people really felt like they're being, they're actually willingly giving up freedoms and um, giving up their um, social life and their, and their kind of everyday normality to try to protect people and to look after the NHS and then it's being broken and that sense of trust and it speaks to the kind of the importance of trust within um, society that politicians are doing what they say they'll do and that they are also um, doing it in the best interest of society and I think the more politicians um, deviate from that the harder it becomes for people to trust them and that has uh, implications that extend beyond the immediate act in itself because it starts to deteriorate the kind of the fabric of the social contract the fabric of what we expect from those in positions of leadership and government um, and I think again it's interesting what we would tolerate from Trump and what we would tolerate from Biden may be different I think it's quite interesting that what um, Trump is able to get away with politically is very different to what we would permit from Joe Biden and I think it's interesting to say, why is that? What is the perception of the character of the man that someone can do so much more with so little consequences, whereas someone else, we hold to a different standard. And we need to be reflecting on that. Like, why is it that that's happening? Um, so I would really speak to the power of integrity and really understanding how we rebuild integrity in political office. Um, and then I would also look as well, this idea of shame is I think so key. We, it's such a powerful political tool, but I think it's incredibly destructive because the more we shame people, I think we find that it has a counterintuitive logic. We think by shaming people for not wearing masks, for not behaving according to certain norms of society, um, for deviating from the standard expectations of behavior, we think that they will change their course of action and come back to behave in the way that we expect they should. But actually shame often forces people to entrench even more in that identity or to do other behaviors that are equally provocative. Um, and I think it also makes it harder for them to then feel heard and understood, which makes it harder to then connect, to bring them back into the political space, to then create something that's more um, inclusive and fair. And so we need to be looking at how we're using it. And shame certainly has a role, um, but we need to look at when, it's, when the balance is wrong. Thank you very much, Claire. That was very enlightening. Um... You talked earlier in your in your in your presentation. You talked about um, morality, and 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 that was sort of linked into the the question of sincere empathy versus um, performative empathy. Um, could it be that there? And oh, well, you also talked about how we don't necessarily see um, Trump's empathy, even though his followers might see his approach as empathetic, um, whereas we um, for us it's easier to recognize Biden's empathy. Might this have something to do with different moral codes so that the value set Trump appeals to gets transmitted through a vehicle that is recognizable by his followers as empathetic and not by us because we have a different value set which is more likely to be a different value set and morality. And this is where one can then start talking about maybe different types of morality which made it make a difference in what we recognize as empathy. Um, I wonder whether you had any thoughts about that or on that. Yes, I mean, I, I, think, I think discussions of morality is so interesting and also again, quite subjective and we, can, we could have a kind of incredible philosophical discussion about um, morality. What I really think it speaks to as well is the diversity in people's expectations of politics and politicians and what they feel their role is and what they feel their engagement with it is and also how involved they want politicians to be and it's interesting do you want politicians who are taking up a moral crusade to end hunger and poverty and provide education for all or do you actually believe that the imperative of politicians is to leave you well alone and to just provide the very basics and then it's up to you to be the responsible citizen who provides it and I think we see this, especially in America, that there are different expectations and demands made. And it's slightly less, I think, in the UK because we have different systems and structures. Um, and I know throughout Europe and beyond, there's kind of every society has its different kind of origins and evolutions that it speaks to. But I think especially in America, 
this idea of morality is connected to um, what people want to see and what they feel is needed and required of society. Um, and we're seeing that really play out right now. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question from Monica Jill. Thank you for, your, for a great discussion. Could Claire possibly speak to the relationship between empathy and compassion? How as tools might they be deployed in different ways in politics? Over yeah. to you, Claire. And I really probably should have given a definition in the first opening section on the difference between empathy and compassion. So thank you for that question. So empathy and compassion, I think are connected, but they're not the same. Um, compassion is an expression of care for another, and it's often a pro-social act. So compassion often compels action. It compels a response for you to try to alleviate or help the suffering or pain of another. Um, and there's this amazing movement right now, Compassion in Politics, which is really looking at putting care back into politics and really looking at how do we design societies that really privilege individuals, especially vulnerable individuals, but everybody as part of a society. And so I think compassion therefore becomes a really motivating tool for this citizen-centric approach to politics. And empathy is connected to that. And empathy is about acknowledging that there is no unity, unitary experience of society and of politics. And that there is, um, there is a diversity and plurality of experiences um, but it doesn't necessarily compel action to alleviate pain or suffering. I think as a moral could, but as we spoke about, the subjectivity of empathy means that it's multidirectional. And so you then get into questions of who are you empathizing with? What are the implications of that empathy? What's the power of that empathy? Who, um, who should you direct your attention towards? Whose story should you be listening to? So empathy serves as a tool to try to gather as much information and as much understanding to make informed, sensitive, responsive policies to the very different um, communities and experiences that we have with any, within any country. But it doesn't necessarily compel that same action. We then determine how much it informs the responses. So it's more cognitive in some ways. Thank you very much, Claire. I have two more questions. Both are slightly lengthy, but I will still read them out because you need the context in which they've been asked. Both um, contributors, thank you very much for a wonderful or fantastic discussion. Um, so they both were enamored, um, which is good. Um, so Caroline Faber is asking, when you were talking about the role of empathy in foreign policy and particularly in US-China relations, she was thinking about how empathy might connect to or be more central to administrations that have adopted an explicitly feminist foreign or development policy such as Sweden and Canada. And so Caroline was wondering um, whether you had any thoughts on what role empathy might play in a feminist foreign policy. Oh, I think it's absolutely key to a feminist foreign policy. And again, there's some great people who are doing work on feminist foreign policy right now, such as the Centre for foreign, Feminist Foreign Policy. And it really, because of, because the very idea is saying there is not one voice within our foreign policy, it forces people to confront alternative voices. And to say, how do women, for example, experience politics differently? How do policies have diverse implications depending on your gender or your sexuality or your position within society? And what are the implications then for um, the impact of that policy? And I think these countries um, that you mentioned that have started to consider it, uh, recognizing that politics has manifold applications. Um, and if we only look very narrowly at politics as being about dealing with a citizen who is kind of homogenous and um, data driven, we miss the fact that there are so many different stories. We miss the fact that people come from so many different backgrounds and that there, there is this very different um, encounter with politics. And so I, I think it forces self-reflection. And I think that's also one of the things that's key to empathy for me is for people to be empathetic, they have to be willing to self-reflect both on their own um, assumptions, their prejudices, their experiences, um, and their past actions and behaviors, and be able to acknowledge how that's had an impact on others, um, and be willing to kind of recognize and change it where appropriate. Um, because I think it's that kind of management of ego that's really key. Management of ego, I like that concept. That is, that is a very, very important uh, concept. I think underrating the power of humor is, is a 
is partly related to that <laughs> self-deprecation. So, um, Kallis Loggins, I hope I didn't completely mangle and mispronounce that, that surname, uh, um, thanks you for a fantastic discussion and says, um, I'm interested in your recent work on strategic empathy. You spoke earlier about that crucial difference between performative and sincere empathy, but where do you draw the line between the two if strategic empathy is almost inherently a tool for achieving political aim? Is it more about the motivation behind that expression of empathy or rather about the goal it's trying to achieve? Or is that judgment simply made from an individual's own subjectivity? Oh, um, so the difference... <laughs> Small question. <laughs> no, it's really cool. Um, the difference between strategic and performative empathy. I, so strategic empathy, as I understand it, is it's about using empathy as a way to inform sound decision making that takes into account the longer term longer term longer term implications of a policy and really being able to consider how do other people experience what we're doing how have other people in the past experienced us so for example in the case of the US and China the US would ask how does China view the United States based on its past interactions with it but you know the opening of China in the 1800s um, that sense of um, century of humiliation, it's understanding the other to then determine how you design policy and strategy that's more responsive and nuanced towards someone else. And so it, comes, it covers a much broader range of processes within policy making and politics um, in terms of decision making, in terms of diplomatic practice, in terms of the ideas and intellectual process involved. Formative empathy is then about this sense of using empathy to signal your virtues, to signal your character and your care. And that then can be sincere or it could be solely because you acknowledge people right now need to see that I'm on top of the Great Wall of China talking about China's cultural heritage because people need to feel within China, not the people across the table in the room that I'm in, but the people of China need to see that America is thinking differently about China and that we're acknowledging the civilization and the decades of animosity that we've had and to signal that it's coming to an end. And it's not then about understanding the whole Chinese population in a strategic sense, it's understand the formative power that empathy has in saying, we are changing, we are listening, we are caring. Um, and so for me, it's slightly different. They're very connected, but it's slightly different. Performative is very much that kind of, you see it as well, a lot of people talk about how empathetic they are, and then you see that actually behind the scenes, they're not necessarily practicing it or putting it into effect. It's very much about the need to be seen to be virtuous and that virtue signaling. Thank you, Claire. Um, Marina de Larghi, I hope that's correct. Um, asks, does empathy exist in politics in post-Soviet countries, for example, in Russia or Ukraine? Which I think is a really interesting question. I'm assuming it does exist, but let's see what Claire tells us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, mean, I, think, I think whatever you have a sense of shared history or shared identity or common stories you will find that there are sources of empathy that people will feel a sense of connection for the other the question is then what do people do with that um, how does that then inform the way in which they engage with others their sense of identity um, how does it inform politics and i think we've seen in some of the uh, post-soviet countries that some leaders have really played on the empathy that they you know that sense of connection that they feel in terms of identity um, to the history to try to create a different sense of national identity today. Um, but I'm not an expert on kind of the post-Soviet states themselves to be able to give very concrete detailed examples of exactly where we're seeing it. I would have thought Vladimir Putin is, is quite skilled at, at creating performative empathy. Um, his photo series of, uh, of, of, of riding um, Yes. bare-chested through Siberia or gambling with little baby tigers probably is meant to create empathetic connections with a large part of, of, of the of the Russian population so I'm assuming there's quite a lot a lot in there. Now, one yeah. last question, question 
Um, Nikki has come back, which is welcome back, Nikki. Um, she asks, um, in my reading on empathy, I have recently discovered the topic of empathy fatigue, particularly from Professor Kristen Neff, often referenced by Brené Brown. Um, is this something that, Claire, you have seen in your research and could you speak to that, please? Yes, I, I think it's absolutely um, key, this idea that we only have so much bandwidth emotionally, personally, politically, um, and this idea of empathy fatigue where you can no longer take in the concerns of others. And this is why when um, in the concluding uh, part of my remarks, really talking about the need for boundaries within this. And again, it's something that um, these authors also speak about that need to set a sense of, I care, but these are the boundaries. Like, this is what I cannot engage with. Um, and so I think we need to look at how we manage that kind of fatigue. How do you learn about different experiences and really understand some of the hardships that people are going through that maybe we're unaware of, either because we haven't thought to care or because actually it feels like too much to care. We need to be able to engage with that. And I think the more we're able to discuss it and we're able to talk about, for example, Britain's history of slavery um, and colonialism, we have to be having that conversation. And I think in that process, there will be a sense of empathy fatigue that people will, because they don't know what, how to process the emotions that arise with that storytelling, but we have to do it. And I think the more open you have a storytelling process, the more we talk about the problems of those stories, like how it is hard to learn these things that have not been told or shared, but absolutely should be told or shared because they're part of our collective history. The easier it becomes to manage it, that this isn't something that you have to do on your own. It's a collective effort. And I think that therefore helps to alleviate some of that uh, fatigue, but we also need to recognize that it's okay to say, today I need to turn off the news. Today I, I, I don't need to hear another story about the pandemic. I cannot watch a documentary about war. I'm gonna take a break and then I'm gonna come back to it when I'm ready. Like this need for us to always be on and always be empathetic is I think also harmful for ourselves. So it's finding the way to balance it intelligently. So we use it most constructively and most powerfully. Thank you, Claire. Now, I, this is really the last question that we can just about squeeze in. Um, this is from Francisco Lobo. Uh, thank you for your presentation, he says. Do you, and I'm very glad we have a little bit more gender balance here because uh, it was very much skewed towards the female part of the audience um, initially. So, Francisco, you've done well. Um, so he asks, do you believe empathy is the modern equivalent of the revolutionary concept of fraternity? And if so, how can it do better than its predecessor in the 21st century? So how do, can it do better now than its predecessor had been doing? Oh, yes. I mean, I think in some ways, yes. I think what all of these concepts have in common is a desire to recognize our shared humanity. We're all individuals. Um, we're all part of the same uh, community in so many ways and we need to then reconnect with others and I think empathy is about that process of recognizing the shared humanity with others um, of trying to work not for our individual self-aggrandizement and our own gain but for the collective good and to work together as part of a society to create something better that really addresses the inequalities and the injustices that people are seeing and to try and reduce the harms that people are experiencing. So I do, I think these themes are recurring. I think empathy broadens it beyond fraternity to um, sisters and um, you know, everybody else within, that, within the spectrum um, of humankind. And we need to be doing that. Well, thank you very much, Claire. We are almost entirely on the dot. I mean, that is well organized. Thank you for what I thought was an amazingly interesting um, last hour. It was one of those highlights of the day. Um, if I don't learn anything else today, then I shall have done all my learning and then some. I hope everyone in the audience goes away as enriched and stimulated for further thoughts and, and has lots of other creative ideas around empathy. Um, henceforth, thank you again for joining us and for making this such a rewarding experience. Um, I shall formally close the session in a second, but I want to ask Neville whether he would like to have the last word. Forgive me, I'd already switched off just so you wouldn't hear me, me drinking my coffee. Um, I'd just like to thank Claire 
uh, very much for being so open and responsive as well, because some of these questions have been really, really quite challenging questions. Um, and thank you, thank you for addressing them um, and embracing them with great sympathy and understanding. And uh, uh, I agree with Andrea. Um, I've learned a lot today, and I'll carry a lot away from this uh, from this session. Thank you. Thank you to everybody as well for taking part and joining us. Yes, thank you to all the participants for asking very, very good questions. So have a great afternoon and when the weekend comes, a great weekend.